A reading from the book of Genesis. After the man and woman had eaten of the tree, the Lord God called to the man and asked him, Where are you? The man answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Then the Lord God asked, Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. The man replied, The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and so I ate it. The Lord God then asked the woman, Why did you do such a thing? The woman answered, The serpent tricked me into it, so I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you shall be banned from all the animals and from all the wild creatures. On your belly shall you crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. Her offspring will strike at your head, while you strike at their heel. The man called his wife Eve, because she became the mother of all the living. Bebum Domini. You are the highest honor of our race. You are the highest honor of our race. Blessed are you, daughter, by the Most High God, above all women on earth, and blessed be the Lord God, the Creator of heaven and earth. You are the highest honor of our race. Your deed of hope will never be forgotten by those who tell of the might of God. You are the Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Verbum Domini. Today we are celebrating a special votive mass for Our Lady under the title, The Blessed Virgin Mary, Image and Mother of the Church. And one of the possible readings for today is this beautiful passage from John 19 at the crucifixion, where Mary is told, Woman, behold your son, and John, behold your mother. And the reality here that is happening is that Jesus is entrusting his mother to be our mother, that Mary is our spiritual mother, our mother in the order of grace, as Vatican II would say. 
And at the council, we know Paul VI, after the third session, after Lumen Gentium, the document on the church was written, which has a beautiful chapter on Mary, proclaims her under this title, Mother of the Church. The title was used before, but it was solemnly proclaimed here at the council at the request of the bishops and not explicitly stated in the council itself. So Paul VI was moved, and if you read the, uh, his proclamation there, it has a, a beautiful solemnity and love and tenderness about it. So this spiritual motherhood means that she is mother of the church. She is the mother of Jesus, of course, and the disciples, and she is a, an archetype. She symbolizes, she models uh, the church, what the church's role is, who the church is. A type, a prefigurement for the church, yet also not a symbol in the sense uh, that it's disconnected from the reality of the church, but she is the perfect realization of the church, that we can understand the motherhood of the church by meditating on Mary. And all the, as Vatican II said, all the doctrines and teachings about Christ resonate in Mary, right, when she is proclaimed, that it involves uh, so much of all of what we believe about Christ there is, helps us to illuminate our understanding of Mary. So Mary is the personification of the church, that the church is Marian, that she is the face of the church herself. Why is the church considered maternal? It's because in our role as Christians, as believers, we become new creations in Christ. In John's Gospel, in his conversation with Nicodemus, he speaks of being that the disciple must be born from above, must be born uh, unto, into spiritual, supernatural life, that the Holy Spirit, we're born of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit working in us uh, gives us this eternal life that begins now, fulfilled in our heavenly existence, but Jesus is born in us, right? We receive this new life, and this happens in the womb of the church. So the church in her preaching and through the administration of the sacraments and shepherding of the hierarchy, she calls everyone to faith in Jesus to receive this new life in the womb of the church. A mother conceives uh, bears the child, nourishes the child, educates the child, help, helps the child to grow up to be an adult. And this is what the church does through a mystical communion with Christ. So the church, through union with Christ, brings about this sanctification, that she is a virgin and a mother. Virginal in the sense of her dedication to God, her unadulterated faith, that she is spouse of the Holy Spirit, that it's the Holy Spirit bringing this new life, working out our, our sanctification, and uh, that is her role. So women today symbolize the church as spouse and mother, which is the essential reality of the church. And we have a tendency to masculinize the church and just see it as the hierarchy, but the fundamental reality of the church is feminine. So before the Apostle John, who is at the foot of the cross today in this scene, is sent out to proclaim Christ at the Ascension, at the Great Commission, he first has to become a son of Mary, a son of the Church. This is primary, to be born above by the Holy Spirit, to be a believer first and then mission, to receive a mission, the sending out, to receive an office you know, as an Apostle. So John here at the foot of the cross symbolizes the hierarchy of the church, the Petrine office, you know, the governing, shepherding aspect of the church, and also the individual believer, because we're all called to that conversion, we're all called to receive that, that new life. Jesus today, from the cross, the heart of redemption, that he's winning for us the graces of this, of our salvation, addresses Mary as woman. And this term goes back to Genesis, right? Uh, the first uh, chapters of the, of the Bible. Genesis 3.15, the first reading we have today, we're told uh, God in speaking to Adam and Eve after the fall, I will put enmity between you, 
He's speaking here to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is what the church fathers called the proto-gospel, this first proclamation of salvation, a hope of a coming victory in Christ over evil, over Satan, through the woman, right? Through the seed of the woman, the head of the serpent will be crushed while the serpent will only bruise his heel. And we can see that fulfilled in Calvary where he's crucified and dies, but he rises again. So it was only a bruising, but he crushes the head of the serpent. That's what we do down south, right? We want to kill that snake, cut the head off the snake, right? <laughs> he ain't dead till the head's cut off. And, and that's what Jesus does. He wins that victory on Calvary, a definitive defeat of evil. So in the Old Testament, this term woman is also used for Israel that she is uh, feminine as a, a woman and a mother, referred to as daughter Zion or mother of Zion. Zion being the original name uh, for Jerusalem. Daughter Zion, this term used, is the personification of Jerusalem. It's used 20 times in the Old Testament. And linked to Calvary today is especially the use of this term in Isaiah 60, verse 4, where the, the Israelites, the Jews, are returning from captivity in Babylon, returning from <coughs> exile. Isaiah says, lift up your eyes around you and see your children assembled. Look, your sons arrive from afar and your daughters are born in the arms. You know, he uses the term uh, daughter Zion, that she is gathering the people in exile back to Jerusalem, on the hills of Jerusalem, we're told, the hills of Zion. And this is fulfilled on Calvary, that there Mary is the fulfillment of daughter Zion, the fulfillment of Israel gathering her children that have been lost in exile, right? We have been exiled in sin and we can't find our way back, you know, without her help. So she is calling her children back and we are formed as the new people of God, the new Israel, a new messianic people. So in this scene where he, Jesus tells Mary, behold your son, and then to John's son, behold your mother. It's not speaking simply about physically taking care of her mother, that she must be sought to her physical needs. You know, if that was the case, he would address John first, you know, and say, John, take care of Mary. He uses this, uses this exalted language of woman, addressing her as woman, which is this language of salvation history, and the fact that he addresses Mary first in her role. So it's not primarily about John taking care of Mary, it's Mary, a you know, woman, behold your son, that she is the main actor, that the disciple is entrusted to her, that she has a special a maternal role, a special work to do. And then we're told that the disciple took her into his own home. And this also has a, a deep, deeper meaning. Pope Emeritus Benedict said that a better translation would be into his inner being. And other theologians reaffirm this saying that phrase, you know, into his own home means inner life. They would contrast it with other passages of scripture using that phrase, his own inner life, his own interior life, where his, the spiritual goods of one's life are kept, the life of faith. So Mary has a special role in that interior life of faith for all the disciples. So by addressing her as woman, Mary is elevated to this plane of redemption. And her new role undergoes a transformation as the grace of redemption is being merited for us, being won for us by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Her role undergoes a transformation that's brought about as Vatican II describes through this burning charity she has, which is it's an amazing thing. I mean, Jesus, who's forgiving those who crucify him, you know, expressing this mercy of God towards sinners, hanging on the cross, that all this is done for our redemption, Mary is taken up into that charity for us as well, brought, in, John Paul said, into the, the radius of this salvation 
that we are experiencing given to us by Christ. And she is given to all, to all humanity, that she is a mother. It's a new level, a spiritual dimension. Looking at her life, we can say at the Annunciation, where she believes the word of the Archangel uh, Gabriel, she first conceives in her heart and her mind, and then in her flesh, Jesus. She believes she's the first disciple in a real way that motherhood over, certainly over Christ begins there, but also over the believer, because Jesus is uniting himself to all humanity there by taking on human nature. So it, be, it begins there. We see it manifested at the wedding feast of Cana, where we're told the disciples first began to believe in him through this sign, this sign, this miracle that's worked at her request. So again, there in the realm of faith, trying to cultivate faith in disciples. She accompanies Jesus. We see her different scenes in his public life, his public ministry, and then here at Calvary. As I said, as John Paul has said, that, it, that motherhood undergoes this transformation through burning charity where she is taken up into this redemptive act and has this special role to play as the mother of Jesus and the mother of the church. And then we see Mary at Pentecost, which is so beautiful, right? The disciples are gathered there in the upper room praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're told explicitly that Mary is there, that she is working with the Holy Spirit that brings about this new life, this new creations that we are supposed to come. She is there praying for the outpouring of that Holy Spirit, ushering in the new birth of the church there. So she is our mother. May we avail ourselves to her through the rosary, through the angelus, through liturgical celebrations, through our personal piety. May we appeal to her under this title, because she longs to bring to us the gifts of eternal life, this grace that Jesus won for us if we, if we ask. I, I was at a, a wake recently, and it just we prayed the rosary there, and it just struck me as so powerful. You know, people were in different stages of grief, and Mary is there. We have this beautiful tradition, right, to pray the rosary at, at wakes and funerals, that Mary is there to comfort us, you know, that we can pray for the repose of the soul of this person who is recently deceased. She is there as a mother. She never abandons us.